What happened in and around 2010, 2011, though, was I think the beginning of a renaissance for the Blue Jays. We had a couple of things happen. Um, the decision to go back to the classic blue, Blue Jays uniforms, mm -hmm. away from the black uniforms. Yeah. The decision to go back to the classic blue uniforms um, kind of reawakened interest in the brand with the new generation of fans. But to me, the biggest thing, and, and I will say this, the biggest thing to happen was the acquisition of Jose Bautista and the development of Jose Bautista into a superstar. Because if you look back to the all-star votes in 2010, 2011, 2011, Jose Bautista broke Ken Griffey Jr.'s record for all-star votes. That was hugely important because... I, I will I will say this until I'm off the planet, that Jose Batista is the reason the Blue Jays had a national imprint. You know that? Everybody, yep. everybody in the country got involved in getting Jose into the All-Star mm -hmm. game. It was just, it was a really remarkable convergence, certainly for the Blue Jays and for baseball fans in Canada. And also, I would have to think for our next guest, who is going up on the level of excellence on Saturday <laughs> He is Jose Bautista. Jose, thank you very much for joining Kevin and me. Uh, congratulations on a richly deserved honor. I'm sure it's going to be a great day. I'm sure everybody's going to have a lot of fun. There'll be a huge crowd there. Um, August 21st, 2008, when you were traded to the Blue Jays, what did you think... Um, like, what did, where did you see your career going when that deal was made? Well, thanks for having me, guys. And, you know, before I answer that, and I might need you to re-ask the question, I mean, you got to let me follow up that intro because, you know, I'm blushing over here, so I'm glad this is a radio and not a TV interview. <laughs> um, but thank you for your kind words. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, don't, I didn't know, to answer your question, I didn't know where my career was going at that moment. All I knew is I was, ready and looking for a fresh start. You know, I was coming from an organization that was going through a lot of changes in the front office. And with that, you know, what happens typically in baseball, everything changes. I was part of the previous regime and, you know, just like every other player that got signed and drafted, well, not every single one, but the majority of us, um, we, we had a new home by the end of the calendar year. So um, I ended up in Toronto, you know, and I, I, been to Toronto once when I was a member of the, the Tampa Bay Rays briefly in my rookie year, which I was rule five. Um, and that's another story. I think mm -hmm. I might've come there too with Baltimore. I'm not quite sure. I can't remember exactly right now, but you know, I knew that it was a great city, great place to play, but you know, and they had the history, right? That was my recollection being from the Dominican Republic um, was one of the first academies um, was, Four teams was in the Dominican was the Dodgers and, and the Blue Jays. So I knew about the organizations and the Dominican players that had played in it. So I was familiar with the franchise, but as far as my career, just looking for a fresh start and an opportunity. And but I knew, I knew at that point, I had to make some adjustment that would hopefully lead to consistency and in, in my production. And boy, am I glad that I went to Toronto because that's where I find the guidance and the the patience and and also the 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 opportunity that was eventually given to me to, to go back to playing every single day. And, and that's what led to putting up the numbers. Who, who in those early years, when you got to Toronto, who were the guys or who was the guy that kind of that, that you gravitated to and the guys that laid the foundation for you to go on and what be a six time all-star. As far as players and teammates, you know, I, the, the guys that I was circling around were Scott Rowland, uh, B.J. Ryan, I had him in Baltimore for a little bit. You know, Vernon, Marco Scudero, Rod Barajas. Um, it, it was a good mix of guys. Alex Rios. It was a good mix of guys, different personalities. But, you know, it was a different style of the game, the AL East versus and the NL Central, and different makeup of the team, a bunch of veterans on good deals, but guys that were used to success, like Scott Rowland and others, you know, um, Roy Holiday, A.J. Burnett, like, along with the names that I mentioned before, it was just a different makeup of the team. So 
the culture was different. The, the environment was different. There was no, you know, no wasting time and not goofing around. You, you show up to work every single day and we're trying to win. And when we don't, it's not okay. Right. And as opposed to the buyers, I came from great organization, but they were in a different, you know, different um, stage in, in their organizational need for, for winning, I guess, because we were just developing talent, a bunch of young guys trying to make a name for themselves, trying to see if there was, you know, superstars in that mix. And there ended up being a few like under McCutcheon and others and myself and, and some other names, but for some it happened that in Pittsburgh and some others uh, away, but um, you know, those were the guys that I was kind of hanging around, but I would say that the biggest impact for sure was Cito Gaston and Dwayne Murphy and Gene Tennis and the, in the hitting side. Jose, I was very fortunate to play against you in winter ball. And I can just remember that part of it, watching you with bat speed and watching you around the batting cage and how much bat speed you had. And I remember when I was playing against you in winter ball, I can remember where your hand started and the leg kick. And I just wonder, I, I, I listened to you talk here about, you know, evolving into the hitter that you became, but it has to start somewhere. Is there a moment in a cage where, you decided, okay, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to start my hands here. I'm going to kick my leg here, and I'm going to try and backspin balls to the pool side. Do you remember that time that day? No, and, and I don't think I looked I, – I don't think the changes happened like that for me. Um, I think I let my body do what it was wanting to do. For me, it was timing throughout the pitcher's delivery. When do I start? That was the thing for me. And, you know, the more video and the more talking I did with Cito and Dwayne, I understood, like, one, it was completely inconsistent. There was a guy from the stretch, another one from the windup, another one with quick delivery, and another one doing slide steps. I wouldn't know when to start my hands and when to get ready. It, it, was, it was an afterthought. It was something that I never considered at that point. And they were like, listen, you got to find something consistent within every pitcher's delivery that you can go to, and that's your trigger. That's what gets you going. That's what gets you started. And for me, it was the pitcher taking the ball out of the glove. You know, every pitcher has to do it to deliver the pitch. And from there, just worked on that rhythm, that timing. For me, it felt awkward at first because it was ultra early from what I was accustomed to. Um, and it took some time you know, to get used to and get comfortable with it. But eventually I, I got it. And I don't remember one specific day, but um, sometimes I, I think there was some games in September of 09 where just stuff started clicking and I was just not and felt different. And the concern was not like, okay, what am I looking for? What does it feel like? Like I knew it was different and it was more just, okay, how do I repeat it now? So I just changed the focus on it at that point. You know, Jose, I can remember having a conversation with Alex Anthopoulos about you one time, and he was talking about your ability to, to stay in shape. And he said, it's almost like Jose views himself, and he meant this as a, as a, as a compliment. Yep. It's almost like he views himself as a Fortune 500 company. Mm -hmm. You've got to invest in yourself. You've got to do some R&D, right? You know, you, you've, got to, you've got to treat it as a business but at the same time, one of the things that, of course, you were very, you know, it was very obvious. One, you had a burning desire to win. So it wasn't like you were this aloof sort of business-oriented guy. You had a burning desire to win. And you also had kind of a sense of fun, which I think we saw with the whole evolution of Joey Bats. I mean, I can still remember the MLB Network piece you did on, on, on Joey Bats. Just, can you tell us a little bit about how you were able to sort of balance those three um, influences or those three demands? Because quite often it's hard for, for folks to do that, not just in baseball, but, I mean, life in general, to treat, to have fun, but be professional at the same time. Yeah, I think over time you start looking at, you know, what's working, what's not working, what allows me to be great, what do I get the most out of. And, you know, enjoying yourself is huge. Because if you just focus on the business side or, or the professionalism, then you get too stressed out and then you get irritable. And then, you know, you don't have a good relationship with your family or other people. And it, it can it can weigh down on you. So 
you know, having fun is, is essential, but having good habits to, again, going back to that consistency that can breed consistency was important. And, um, you know, I think Alex was, had a good assessment. He's, he's a people person. He can stand back and look and, and kind of inform his opinion. And in that sense, it was pretty accurate. I wouldn't say a Fortune 500 company, but I treat myself as, you know, an athlete that plays a sport he loves for a living, tries to have fun. But in order to get the success, you know, has to put in the work. And then how do I find the best resources to help me achieve, you know, my ultimate goal of hopefully getting the most out of my talent, but, you know, showing up every day and being able to to deliver. And that's just pouring some of my resources into a good trainer, sleep, good nutrition, you know, the mainstays, like, I mean, think about it. If you have, God forbid, knock on wood, to go in to the operating room for surgery, do you want your surgeon the night before to be partying all night and, you know, drinking and doing other stuff when he's going to operate you in the morning? No. So it's the same thing for baseball. It's just, it takes discipline, it takes dedication. And again, it's not like you were, I was a robot or, have to do it every single day out of my life but there's a balance in everything and i think having the different things to to focus on at different times of the day allowed me to create enough separation to where i wasn't you know too stressed out because i was only single focus on on one of those three parts jose how do you watch the game now like as a hitter a former hitter a former really good hitter how do you watch the game do you have it bats at home i'm i try to do that i was never the hitter you were but i try to have that on the on deck circle at bat. Do you do that? I try. I try to follow the, the flow of the game and how pitches are trying to attack. And But for the most part, man, it's hitting is getting harder and harder. It is. Um, it, I mean, to get, to have guys that even on the starting rotation, you don't have the Jeff Supons in the world, you know, just mm. throwing 90 to 91, two seamers with a big lollipop breaking ball and maybe a decent changeup, you know? Uh, everybody's throwing 95 plus and if it's out of the bullpen forget about it some of the off-speed stuff is over 90 miles an hour and they attack the, the top of the zone it feels like you know since you know i got to the big leagues and throughout my career it feels like the strike zone has changed a little bit um they call the high pitch a little more often and for me that was my weakness i love the low pitch and um that's maybe why i struggled a little bit towards the end of my career um it, it's just hard. It, it seems like everybody's just out there looking to, to swing and a miss uh, from the pitching side, and everybody at the plate is looking for homers. I think that era of that style may be coming to another transition and hopefully getting back to with some of these rule changes too, pushing it um, a little bit of old school. And by that I mean, hit and runs, more stolen bases and more high contact and pitch efficiency and getting guys out with less amount of pitches. Um, I think that's a, that creates more action. I think it's a more enjoyable, you know, product to watch from, from home on the TV. So I can't wait for those changes to keep impacting the game the way that it has. So, uh, but it's tough, man. When I look at what pitchers are doing these days and then see like what that kid, Arias is doing in Miami. I'm like, man, he is gifted because I don't know how that's possible with some of the stuff coming out of these guys' hands. Yeah. Now, Jose, I'm pretty certain that at some point Saturday, uh, the uh, video of the bat flip will be played. I think it's probably safe to say that. Um, obviously, it was a signature moment for this franchise. It's a signature moment for you. It's, I mean, it's a signature moment in Canadian sports history. It's still... People watch it and they still get goosebumps. Um, do you think people, do people overlook the balance of your career because of that? In other words, do you ever get tired of having people ask you questions about it like I just did or come up to you and talk about it? Like, because there was so much more to you in your career than that bat flip. No, it doesn't. It doesn't become that at all. I mean, you understand it and it's a conversation piece, right? And mm -hmm. it typically... People lead with it and they start with that. But that's, or at least from my interaction and my personal experience, talking to fans and other other folks, uh, it it goes beyond that. Um, and I'm grateful. So, but to be remembered for doing something great for a franchise that 
hadn't been in the playoffs for 22 years. Am I going to complain about that? Absolutely not. I think uh, I was lucky enough to be in that moment and even happier that I was able to do something positive. Uh, other than the bat flip, is there a moment that you remember? Like mine was the first day I got called up. That was probably the most important part of my baseball career. Do you have a moment like that? Like, is there one of those moments where no matter what, you'll never forget that? Yeah, clinching the playoffs for the first time was huge. I mean, at that point, I had played in the big leagues for over 10 years. Um, my first, again, day in the big leagues, I was with the Orioles, having gotten Rule 5 from the Pirates. That was huge. So two days before getting the news after being with them for all spring training from Lee Mazzilli that I had made the team, that was a great moment. Hitting, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 home runs, 54 home runs, all those moments are are you know, ones that I'm going to cherish forever. And uh, I get to enjoy them now that I'm retired. Awesome. Did, uh, was there, did you ever run into to folks with the Orioles or the Pirates or even the Rays organization to say, man, you know, we, I can't believe we had you in our hands and, and we let you go. And if you did, how did you take that? Was that just, just, you know, the business of baseball? Yeah, it's the business of baseball. I mean, I've seen it happen you know, on the other end, by me being a teammate of somebody that leaves and ends up being great somewhere else. Um, you know, what? there's so many variables to that analysis that it's it's kind of hard to pinpoint because every situation individually mm-hmm. is so different. So, but I have heard comments, um, especially from people that say um, something to the tune of, I knew that we shouldn't have let you go. I kept asking them to keep you or something like that. But yeah, it's fun to reminisce and come in, in contact with people that, you know, your baseball path kind of crossed in the past and just kind of, you know, have that type of conversation. Jose, listen, we really appreciate you joining us today. It's going to be a lot of fun on yeah. Saturday. Enjoy it. Congratulations. It's uh, very richly deserved. Yeah. Thank you both. Thanks for having me.